This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Macro Voices, episode 225, was recorded on June 25, 2020. I'm Eric Townsend. This episode of Macro Voices is dedicated to healthcare workers all around the world, the true heroes of the COVID-19 pandemic crisis, and is brought to you by TopTradersUnplugged.com, a podcast dedicated to quant and rules-based investing, helping investors overcome behavioral biases. Harley Bassman, inventor of the Move Index, returns as this week's feature interview guest. Harley and I will discuss everything from the recession outlook to the coming shift from deflation to inflation and what it means for fixed income markets, Harley's specialty. Then be sure to stay tuned for our post-game segment when Patrick and I will play a game of breakout or fakeout, looking at gold, the euro, U.S. dollar, stocks, corn futures, and a bunch of other key financial instruments to discuss which ones are breaking out versus which ones are maybe just showing some fake signs of a breakout. And I'm Patrick Ceresna. Now, Eric, before we get to the markets, the coronavirus has moved back into the headline. What's going on here? Well, indisputably, there's been a big surge in new infections. There's new cases soaring across the United States and globally. The uh, Houston intensive care capacity has been breached, causing the Houston hospital system to have to activate their overflow plan. Some people are saying second wave is really not the right phrase to describe this because it's really not like a second wave that came, you know, with the fall weather or something. It's really the first wave never really stopped. And as soon as we've tried to reopen things uh, and we've had all these protests and so forth with less social distancing, predictably, there's been a dramatic increase in new infections. So it was easy to see this coming. It's not really news. But, you know, you look at what happened the first time around. The market didn't really want to take the news seriously until it was staring them in the face. So as easy as it was to see this coming, I don't think it's fully discounted in markets. Patrick, I think the real essential point here goes back to that Hammer and Dance article that we recommended to our listeners a couple of months ago now it's been. The whole idea of the hammer and the dance is you start with the hammer, which is the lockdown, but then it's a dance. It's a balancing act. The word dance was a metaphor to describe it's not easy to find the right balance of how quickly you can reopen things versus what the effect of that is in terms of bringing on more infections and causing the pandemic to to grow in its proportions. It seems like we're trying to dance with combat boots on or something. You know, we're, we're trying to reopen everything thing very quickly. President Trump, meanwhile, announced this week the solution is less testing. He actually said that that, uh, we needed to slow down testing because more testing was leading to more infections being detected, making us look bad. And uh, the White House doing damage control very promptly said, well, obviously the the president was just joking when he said that. And then sure enough, the president doubled down both on Twitter and in a, uh, I believe it was an NBC News interview saying, no, I'm I'm dead serious. We we have a problem, which is we're doing too much testing and it's causing an exaggerated number of cases to be detected relative to other countries that are not doing as much testing, makes us look bad. And when in reality, the situation is not as bad as it really is. And he's actually uh, asking the federal government to start to remove the federal funding for state testing centers in order to try to test less. You know, Patrick, when uh, Dr. Ben Hunt was on the program uh, saying, you know, don't test, don't tell, I thought he was kind of being sarcastic. Well, it seems like it's actually becoming policy now. Meanwhile, Patrick, the new big headline, and I think you're going to be hearing a lot more about this buzzword, it's called D614G. And that is a reference to a mutation of the coronavirus, which has occurred at the 614th position in the genetic sequence. That's where the 614 comes from. And as I understand it, the whatever the amino acid is that starts with a D changed to one that starts with a G. It's just one little amino acid that's part of a long string of amino acids in the RNA sequence 
which defines the particular virus genetics. That change, according to, and this is important, according to new data out of China. Well, if there's ever anything you want to take with a grain of salt, it's new data out of China, because needless to say, the Chinese government has been a little bit guilty of massaging its data and uh, sometimes twisting the facts a little bit. So is this propaganda or is it all completely real? We don't know that yet. This is not yet peer reviewed. But what they're saying is this new mutation, which the Chinese government is calling the European strain. They're saying it came from Europe. We didn't do it. They're saying it's much more infectious, more deadly, has a much higher case fatality rate, according to new data in Chinese research studies, which have not yet been peer reviewed, suggesting that this new strain of coronavirus is more infectious and more deadly than the original strain, which is just being called D614. Now, there's very significant implications to this next point, which is not only is it more infectious, but people who tested positive for antibodies to the original coronavirus, the D614 version, are being reinfected by the D614G version. They're, they're finding that the antibodies do not protect you. The antibodies to the old strain do not protect people who had already experienced this disease in the, the original strain. That doesn't protect them from getting it again with the second strain. So in other words, there is no immunity between the two strains. That has very significant implications on the efficacy of any vaccine that might be developed. And I think if we zoom out to the, the big picture, you know, let's just assume all of this new data from China might be real, might be propaganda. We don't know yet. That, that research and scrutiny still needs to occur in the scientific community. But if I step way back out, Patrick, you know, so many people are just assuming that a vaccine within a year is a given. It's really not a given. There's never been a successful coronavirus vaccine in human beings. Needless to say, we've got a lot more incentive to come up with one this time. But I'm going to give it a 50-50. I think it is equally possible we could have a vaccine or we could go through a five-year period of a slow development of herd immunity around the world, during which time we would still have, a, a, you know, what we're seeing right now, which is this dance continues for several more years while we don't have a vaccine and basically we have to temper fully reopening the economy against exacerbating the uh, the pandemic. So this thing, you know, I think what we're seeing in society is people are done with it. They want it to be over. It could be that this is just getting started in terms of how long this story is going to affect the global economy. Now, of course, I, I hope that uh, that's a pessimistic view and that we end up with a vaccine that's ready in three months and solves the whole problem for everybody. But if we don't, you know, this could take a lot longer than is being priced into markets. Now, having said all of that, Patrick, I want to be clear. I am not predicting that we go back to a, a new total shutdown where we lock down the economy. I, I think what's very clear now is a lot of people are very angry that the first lockdown happened. And regardless of whether those people are right or wrong, it doesn't really matter. The point is there's lots of them and there's a strong public sentiment against further lockdowns. People want to reopen the economy. And my prediction is we will reopen the economy, whether that involves a lot of public health risk or not. We're going to do it anyway. So now the question is how much public health risk and how much of an imposition that creates in terms of people making voluntary choices, not to travel, not to vacation, not to travel internationally, and so forth, and how much that affects the global economy. The economic analysis is much harder this time around, because the first time around, you knew what was going to happen. They're going to shut everything down. It's going to result in a sudden stop in the economics. This time, it's much more complex. We don't know how much is going to be shut down, how long it's going to stay shut down, and what voluntary choices people are going to make. To my own surprise, Patrick, my own vacation rental on the coast of Maine, I thought was going to be a total write-off for this season. It was sold out as of the beginning of the season, before the virus. And sure enough, we had almost everyone cancel. And then new bookings have replaced them and were booked solid again for the rest of the summer, at least out until the 1st of September. So it seems like there's at least part of society that wants urgently to get out and travel and spend money and go back to the old normal as quickly as they can. As soon as things are unlocked, let's go. 
Uh, on the other hand, I think there's probably other people that are more conservative that are going to stay home. It's going to take a long time to figure out what the real economic impact is going to be. All right. Well, let's move on to that S&P 500. Well, in the last 24 hours, we saw some selling. But when you kind of zoom out on the chart, we've more or less been in an incredibly tight range for well over a week and almost two weeks going on this uh, chop back and forth. Uh, Which way do you think it's going to break here? Well, Patrick, I could see this going either way. And we're going to get into more detail on the possibilities in the postgame. But briefly, I see more resilience than weakness in this chart. Look at what's happened in the last couple of weeks. We've had more and more news flow confirming what I predicted, which is, you know, there has been an increase in coronavirus cases. There's a lot of reason for concern. And uh, although there's been some selling, it really, you know, we're not dropping off a cliff or anything. I think that the market is expecting more stimulus and those stimulus expectations are keeping things elevated. So no real change in in my view. I, I think that as much as I'm not at all optimistic about the economic fundamentals, I think the market may just be held up by stimulus expectations and might even move back to new all-time highs. All right, well, let's move on to the dollar index. We uh, similarly had a bit of a breakdown at the start of the week. Much of it's been recovered. We're still below the 98 handle. What's your thinking here on the dollar? Well, at least we're stabilizing here around the 97 handle on the uh, September contract. You know, more coronavirus crisis, uh, which clearly we're seeing, should be dollar bullish. But on the other hand, more stimulus as a result of that from the Fed should be dollar bearish. But if there's more stimulus from other central banks debasing their currencies, that should be dollar bullish. So, you know, which way is that all going to play out? I think it depends a lot on the news flow and, you know, who stimulates first between the central banks. I don't really have a strong view here. All right. Well, let's uh, move on to oil because uh, oil at this stage had at least uh, a reversal off of that uh, 40 level. And uh, we're now sitting around uh, 3886 on the August contract. What's your thinking here uh, on crude? Well, as I've been saying for the last couple of weeks, I told our listeners, watch for this rally to peak somewhere between 41 and $42 as that gap on the chart gets filled in. 41 spot 66 was the peak, so that's just about exactly consistent with what we expected. Then it rolled over exactly as I predicted. The thing is, that was the easy part. The question is, rolled over to go down how far? There's an argument, Patrick, that this could already be over. You know, what we saw was a very sudden sell-off over the last couple of days, taking out the short-term moving averages. That set a target for the 21-day moving average. We traded below it on an intraday basis, so we fulfilled that target, but closed above it, which would suggest there's, at least for the immediate uh, time frame, there is no further downside expectation until we get a close below 37 spot 80 or so, which is the 21-day moving average on the continuation chart. And we're back up to just barely above the 13-day moving average at 38 spot 71. If we can get a daily close above 39 spot 57, which is the five-day moving average, that would suggest that the uptrend has resumed. So it is possible this is over. It's not my base case. I think we've got further down to go. I'm just not sure how far. 100-day moving average is the next obvious target. That's 36 spot 03. If we get a close below that number, uh, then the next target is probably down around to 33.50 or so. And uh, I think to go much lower than that, it would take some nasty news flow. The thing is, I think we might have some nasty news flow in the works with respect to the coronavirus crisis. Crisis. So, uh, you know, as far as how far down it could go, I don't think you go below 26. So 26 to 30 might be if the virus fears really kick up where the target range is. But I don't think you go below 26 unless you get a return of storage crisis fears, uh, another expectation that we're going to run out of storage and there's going to be no place to put the oil. Now, that sounds, it seems like it's not going to happen because without a doubt, the market has been pricing expectations that the storage crisis is all over and behind us. But let's look at inventory. Crude oil building 1.4 million barrels plus another 2 million barrels that went into the SPR. And even though that's the government's SPR, what's being put there is commercial storage. The government's leasing it out to commercial interests. So really, the net build of commercial storage was 3.4 million barrels. That's a pretty big build. And it takes us to a new all-time high in U.S. crude oil.
oil inventory. So, you know, this storage crisis is not necessarily over yet, although the market is definitely not pricing any expectation of running out of space. Cushing, Oklahoma, drawing down 991,000 barrels, which says to me the industry heavies are still focusing on getting as much oil out of Cushing and into the SPR as they can to make more spare capacity at Cushing because it's running out in Cushing specifically that resulted in that uh, blow up or, or breakdown, I guess you should say, of the, uh, of the May contract as it was expiring. They don't want to let that happen again, and they're trying to free up more storage space in Cushing. Gasoline drawing down 1.7 million barrels, distillates building about a quarter million barrels, 249,000 barrels. U.S. production back up to 11 million barrels. That was down 600,000 barrels to 10.5 million last week. Looks like maybe that was an anomaly in the data because we're back up to 11 million, which is only 100,000 less than it was two weeks ago. Market reaction to the inventory data was an acceleration of a sell-off that was already in progress. I also did an All-Stars interview with Anas Alhaji on Monday. Be sure to check that out on your Macro Voices feed for more color on what's going on and what to expect longer term in the oil market. All right. Well, let's move on to gold because yesterday we uh, came within a stone throw of 1800 A little bit of backing up uh, off of that price today. But uh, what's your take here on gold? Well, as I've been saying for the last few weeks, it's been looking more and more like that base that we're seeing forming at 1700 maybe 1680 on an intraday basis is going to hold. And I think I, I, I said last week or the week before, the thing to watch for is we've been testing the bottom end of that range. Are we going to test the top end of that range? Well, sure enough, now we're testing the top end of that range. In fact, yesterday we broke out to a new five-year high on an intraday basis, but didn't close up there. We, we you know, poked above it, played around a little bit, and back down. As we're speaking now on Thursday afternoon, we're sitting right about on the five-day moving average at 1770. Now, still, it, it looks to me, feels to me, like we're maybe on the verge of a breakout to the upside from this consolidation range. It hasn't happened yet, so we don't really have the buy signal yet, but it looks to me like we could be on the cusp of it. I won't be at all surprised if it happens, and if it does happen, the way I see the chart, Patrick, I, I'd be curious to get your reaction, because uh, you're the, the better technician here, but it seems to me like the 1922, the previous all-time high is probably the next target if we get a breakout, say, north of 1,800. Well, Eric, I think uh, w when we put up the chart on gold in the post game was one of the charts we we're going to have that very conversation as to whether it is a breakout and and what would we can even talk about where the next targets are. But for certain, when you're talking about all time highs, uh, like you were saying at the 1922, that's always a target for most investors once a, a breakout occurs. So I think you're right about that one. All right, Eric, let's touch on that 10 year treasury yield. Well, Patrick, no real change to my view. I don't have any opinion up or down short term. What I'm focusing on is the long term picture, which is, is the almost 40 year bond bull market coming to an end or isn't it? And are we moving from deflation to inflation? And if so, what does it mean for the bond market? As far as the short term outlook, I don't have a view, Patrick. Do you? Well, I continue to th see that the path of least resistance is that the yields are heading lower, and this continues to be the big canary in the coal mine, in my view, in terms of a risk-off cycle. I mean, uh, will we see the breakdown here in uh, the 10-year Treasury yields, and is that something that is much more important on a broader intermarket basis? And that's certainly something to, that I continue to watch. Nonetheless, uh, this week's feature interview guest is uh, fixed-income guru Harley Bassman. Now, he is the inventor of the Move Index, which is basically the VIX for the bond market. So, Eric, why did we invite Harley back as a guest this week? Well, Patrick, as I said, the reason I don't have a view on the short-term outlook for Treasury yields is I think we've really got to figure out the big long-term picture of what's going on with inflation to deflation and so forth. And I'm trying to get more guests on the program that are big picture macro thinkers who have a specialty in fixed income, who really understand the bond market. How could you ask for a better guy than the man who invented the move index, the convexity maven, as he's known in the industry? So Harley is a real pro when it comes to understanding the, the bond market, and he's got a very long-term macro perspective. So I wanted to get him on so that we could ask these questions that are leaving me with nothing to say every week when we get to 10-year Treasury yields.
Meanwhile, folks, I also want to remind you, we really need your help. If you can rate and review us on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, it'll get us back up to our deserved rating that we used to have as the best investment podcast on the network. We've fallen off of Apple's radar because we haven't had enough reviews. The instructions for how to post a review are linked in your research roundup email, or you can just go on iTunes and uh, click on ratings and reviews. Give us a five-star review. It'll really help us out. This episode of Macro Voices was made possible by TopTradersUnplugged.com. In recent weeks, we've been reminded of the fragility of world financial markets and how quickly sentiment can shift from risk on to risk off. Once again, the mantra of buy the dip and the determination of central banks will be put to the test. But as Chris Cole recently told us, the best approach to investing in the long run is very different from what's worked best in recent decades. To help Macro Voices listeners navigate an uncertain future, Niels Kastrup Larson, host of the Top Traders Unplugged podcast, has created a guide to the best investment books of all time. You can get a free copy at toptradersunplugged.com forward slash macro guide. And be sure to listen to my full length interview with Niels Kastrup Larson on trend following. The download link is in your research roundup email. Check out toptradersunplugged.com today. You'll be glad you did. Eric's interview with Harley Bassman is coming up as Macro Voices continues right here at macrovoices.com. And now with this week's special guest, here's hedge fund manager Eric Townsend. Joining me now is Harley Bassman, best known as the inventor of the Move Index, which is essentially the VIX for the bond market, and now known as Convexity Maven and publisher of ConvexityMaven.com. Harley prepared a terrific slide deck to accompany today's interview. Listeners, I strongly encourage you to download it as we'll be referring to those slides throughout the interview. You can find the download link in your Research Roundup email. If you don't have a Research Roundup email, just go to our homepage at MacroVoices.com. Look for the red button that says looking for the downloads. Harley, I want to start with a call that you made way back in November of 2018 and which you reiterated in May 2019. And you said, look, there is a economic recession coming at the beginning of 2020. Now, obviously, you didn't know that the COVID-19 pandemic was coming. Do you think that the recession is uh, something that happened as a result of COVID-19? Or do you think that COVID-19 was just the catalyst that lit the fuse, so to speak, for something else that was already bound to happen? Because, of course, the president of the United States told us we had a perfect economy right up until the virus hit. Eric, thank you for inviting me back to your show, the best uh, financial podcast in the market. So I'll tell you, they, it, this kind of lines up with the, uh, you know, the two thoughts I always put up on the front of my, uh, my website, which is, number one, it's always about character. Character matters and it's paramount. And number two is it's never different this time. And when you saw the yield curve start to begin to invert, and so on slide one, that's the Fed database showing the you know, Fed funds versus the curve. But more important, slide uh, number two, which where the funds rate was above the five-year, five-year forward rate, uh, the aversion was coming. And the yield curve has been the best predictor of a recession. And, and what always happens, uh, I'm not sure always is the right word, but what usually happens is they kind of come out of nowhere. You, you never see these things coming. Um, and, and people always say, what's the next surprise going to be? which is kind of like jumbo shrimp. I mean, you can't see a surprise. It wouldn't be a surprise if that was the case. So do I see this? Of course not. I think I wrote multiple times, I have no idea how we're going to go into a recession, but the curve is there. Somehow the market seems to anticipate this, and, and, and there we go. So I, I, I suppose it was the, um, you know, the match, I guess. But uh, in general, these things always seem to occur in some fashion where something finally pushes the market and the economy over. Harley, we recently had Dr. Lacey Hunt on the show, and one of the things that he told us was that the population is declining, and that's one of the reasons that he thinks that unless there was a major change to the Federal Reserve Act, we're probably looking at deflation for the foreseeable future. I see on slide three, you're not really showing a declining labor force or population. What's going on here? Well, Dr. Hunt probably is one of the... uh best economist in the market. Uh, he's been 
dead bright for, for my entire career on the bond market to, uh, to keep rallying. Uh, so I highly recommend reading him, as well as uh, Gerard Minnick. And uh, that'll be another slide I have of his. I, I think what he's pointing to over here is the concept that GDP, at the end of the day, is you know labor force, number of people, times hours worked, times productivity. That's GDP in a nutshell. Productivity really hasn't altered that much in the last decade, despite the introduction of better technology. And, um, you know, hours worked, and we're kind of at the top of where we're going to be on that. So the real difference is going to be the labor force. And what, well, he is, and many observers are right, that Western democracies are having a declining population growth. Uh, what's happening in the U.S. is the baby boomers are retiring right now, but soon we will deplete them. We're about halfway through the boomer demographic, and the millennials are going to be coming on in. And what's happening is there's an inflection, and I've been writing about this for oh God, five to eight years now, an inflection coming 2023 to 2025, somewhere in there, where the millennials are entering the workforce at a faster rate than the boomers are declining. So you look at this chart on page three, you can see that Dr. Hunt's right. You do have a declining overall population growth rate, but the the makeup of it is altering. And so as these millennials come in, that's what's going to go and create demand for goods and services. And this kind of chart actually follows uh, very closely. If you look at some of my past commentaries on my website, you'll see, um, I've noted that you should see that this labor force growth rate aligns very well with uh, interest rates and inflation. I also note that, that uh, you know, which is a current topic about uh, immigrants, that I think immigration is going to be a uh, a gigantic impact, and that immigration is probably the the most worrisome aspect that I have going forward in the next you know five to ten years. I thought it might be tax policy. I thought it might be uh, uh, buybacks, maybe trade policy, but immigration is probably it because if we've had a very strong immigrant growth over the last you know forever, and if we were to go choke that off as we're trying to come out of this recession over here, that could be very problematic because that will choke off your labor force growth rate, which would not be uh, pleasant. Harley, our regular listeners know one of the topics that I've been most concerned about in the last year or so is the possibility of the historical correlation between stocks and bonds changing in a way that might force the unwind of the entire risk parity trade, which is probably the biggest trend in institutional finance. You've got a chart on page four from Gerard Minack at Minack Advisors. Uh, what is this chart telling us? How do we interpret what's on this page in terms terms of giving us some insight as to whether or not that concern of mine may be well-founded or not. You're exactly right. And as a macro concept, you got to tie together the entire notion of labor force growth rate with interest rates and inflation, which then bleeds into this chart over here. And the whole thing comes together in the next two, three, five years. And we should all be concerned about this. This is, this is the big macro concept uh, that I believe in. And so the correlation between stocks and bonds generally has been inverse. One goes up, the other goes down. So risk parity has been the brilliant strategy for the last decade because a portfolio, let's say a 60-40 portfolio, will balance itself out. Stocks go up, bonds go down, and vice versa. If we were to get inflation above 25 in the chart here on page four, or let's say 10-year rates above Three and a half before percent, because you have real growth plus inflation gives you in theory the ten year rate, you're probably gonna see this correlation flip back to what it was in prior times, where stocks and bonds go up and down together. This is gonna be very problematic because so many people are have blended portfolios, but what's really gonna be the issue is the risk parity types who use leverage. Because stocks are more volatile than bonds, so people will often say you have $100 of, of, of capital, of assets, uh, of money, and then you buy, let's say, $130 of bonds and $70 of stocks. You have $200 total of investments supported by 100 bucks of, of, of equity capital. If they both go down together, well, now you've got a problem and you have to liquefy. And that's what you saw in, uh, in March when both stocks and bonds went down together for a small amount of time. That's where you had the most volatility because they were not acting as a hedge, but they're acting together. So I, I, I kind of foresee this happening, but it's not happening until 2023 to 2025. 
That's what's going to happen because the, the labor force growth rate is going to turn up and you're going to get the inflation. As a reminder, the last time we had this kind of huge labor force growth rate was in the late 70s, early 80s, when, ha-ha, that's when the boomers were turning 30, 35. At that age, what do you do? You get married, you have kids, you buy a house, you buy a car, a washing machine, and everything else, and all this demand is greater than the supply available from the previous generation, so the World War II generation, which was smaller. And that correlates very well with uh, interest rates and inflation. So that's the cycle that I'm looking for, and all fits together. So you're right, but you're early. It's not happening till at least three more years from now. Okay, Harley, great. Let's translate that characterization that you just made of my being right but early that we're headed toward a secular shift toward inflation and a, a different correlation between bonds and stocks. What does that mean in terms of right now with respect to portfolio positioning? Do you stay long duration risk and you know continue to wait for a little bit more of the deflation trend to, to bring bond yields down even more before you start figuring out how to reposition? Or is this something where it's hard to gauge the timing and, you know, boy, it's it's been 40 good years of or almost 40 good years of bond bull market. Is it time maybe to not worry? about catching those last few percent and start to reposition a portfolio now just in case I turn out not to be as early as we hoped. I, I kind of think you're leading me, the horse to water here, to the idea of negative rates because that's kind of what you would require to get you know, a lot more upside in industry products. I'll say up front, the answer is no to that. We're not having negative rates in the U.S. I guess in theory it's possible, but no. Uh, it, it's, this is the way we're structured. And frankly, the idea hasn't worked even where it's been tried. We're a financial economy. To disintermediate the banks in such a way would be disastrous. Do I think you should be selling rates here? Uh, no. I mean, I wouldn't be buying 30 bonds at, at a buck and a half. But I think that we're not going to have a huge rise in rates. What I would recommend instead is into other risks, such as convexity or, or, or credit, high-grade credit. And the reason why I like that is if you go to page five, this over here, one of my favorite charts, is the relationship between the yield curve. The yield curve is the measure between the two-year rate, the 10-year rate, three-month rate, and the five-year rate, whatever it might be, some measure of the slope of the curve, which kind of indicates people's concern about the market and inflation. And the other, other line is going to be implied volatility. And what you see happening here is when the curve flattens, volatility comes down. And I think with the Fed holding rates low and steady for a while, I mean, the dot plot said they're holding the funds rate at basically zero for the next 30 months. That kind of means that volatility should come down. And you've already seen it in the bond market where you've seen uh, uh, what the 10-year rates moved, what, 20 basis points for the last few months. That's going to go and reduce volatility, not risk per se, but actually realize volatility, which is more important. And I think that's going to make a number of investment instruments interesting. Mortgage REITs, I happen to be, I happen to favor those. Not REITs where you're actually buying the properties. I'm talking about the levered REITs where they buy secured mortgages, usually Fannie and Freddie, but it can be Alt A or, or non agency. I like those a lot because I think it's going to be not that hard to hedge them. And they yield an awful lot in a you know 1% environment. And I think that if you look at page, Six, what I'm showing here is the mortgage, the rate on mortgage bonds. So if you go buy a Fannie or a Freddie mortgage bond, so there's no credit risk whatsoever to those. They're guaranteed by the government. And you look at that versus the 10-year swap rate, you can see that we're kind of about average right now. You see the big jump we had. We're on page six. Uh, the big jump we had when the financial crisis hit, but how it quickly came back once the Fed said, okay, we'll We'll buy these bonds. We're kind of average there. But if you look at page seven, you can see how there's room for this spread to come in even further relative to volatility. And that's why I like that asset, that asset class. I think the Fed's goal is, is multiple, which I think we'll get into the inflation part soon. But they want to reduce volatility. They want to reduce risk. They want to bring risk taking into the market, the idea of starting a new business or expanding a business you already have. That's the idea of holding rates low and holding them steady. 
two different concepts. One of them is your cost of capital. The other is the risk that you're going to be wrong. And by reducing volatility, they reduce the risk that, of uncertainty in the future. And in theory, that should go make you willing to take more risk in starting or expanding a business. So they're, they're, they're not wrong in the macro sense, but I mean, zero is kind of a tough number to use. Here's where I get nervous about any kind of spread trade in fixed income markets, Harley, is, you know, we've got what I'll call policy risk, which is you could have made a really good argument a few months ago for, boy, look at what's going to happen economically. You know, the the high yield spread above treasuries has got to blow out. Well, that would make sense if you were reading the Federal Reserve Act the way it's written, which is to say it's illegal for the Fed to buy junk bonds. But the Fed came up with its own interpretation of the Federal Reserve Act, that it, it actually is OK for them to buy junk bonds as long as they play some little game with the Treasury of supposedly being an intermediary, that, which, in my opinion, was designed intentionally to undermine the intention of the Federal Reserve Act. So if you got the government changing their own rules kind of willy nilly without warning, how do you bet on spreads between different interest rate products when you never know what kind of policy or, or legal interpretation might be coming next? I think it depends upon if you're looking at the price of the asset or you look at the underlying fundamentals of it. Uh, I, I, I think that buying junk bonds is, is, is ill-considered for so many reasons, one of them being that it disrupts the signaling process. It, that's so important in a, in, a, in a capitalist system is to have the market, free markets where prices signal what might happen and get people to prepare for risk, to hedge properly, to be prepared for what might happen and, and not be over their skis and thus really hurt if things go go south. Usually when a bond goes below a certain price, they'll qualify as a, I don't want to say junk bond, but, but something to be concerned about. We see a stock with a very high dividend yield that's much higher than its peers. That's usually a signal there's a problem with the company. The Fed's kind of covering that now, which I think is a bad idea. On the other hand, high-grade corporate bonds, high-grade mortgages, those are basically probably fundamentally economically sound. And then you're looking at the concept of where does the Fed set the rate? And if they've set the, the risk-free market rate at, a, at zero, and they've said it's going to be here for you know, two and a half years, more or less, you, know, you could be more comfortable switching to that. So maybe I'd rather buy a five-year corporate bond than a 30-year you know, treasury bond. So I'm, I'm, I'm saying you should be altering your portfolio uh, to take uh, advantage of the fact that the Fed's going to hold rates down for a while and they're going to reduce volatility. Because a corporate bond or a mortgage bond, the extra yield you're getting over a treasury is effectively an option. The price of an option is driven by its implied volatility. And if that's going to come down, that asset should do better. So that's the, that's the concept there. Harley, let's tie all of these concepts together and relate them to a subject that I've discussed with quite a few of our guests. And I know you're a regular listener to the show, so you're aware of all this. Are we headed for a secular shift, not just to a little bit of inflation, but to secular inflation? And if so, how long does that take to play out? What does it look like? What's the transition look like? How do we get from here to there? Well, I'm not a gold bug, but I like the concept because we're going to get inflation. The question is when. It's, it's almost a religious belief in the sense, do you believe that you could print fiat currency at will, or at least at a rate faster than the growth of the economy without inflation? Uh, I think, no, that can't happen. The thing is the timing. It could take many, many years for it to bleed on through. So we're going to have inflation. The question is, when will it occur? What will drive it? Once again, back to the idea of the, of, of, of the match lighting a, a fire. When is it going to happen? 2023 to 2027, somewhere in there. Going back to Dr. Hunt and talking about money printing, and he's a deflationist, at least uh, temporarily. He's right in the concept the Fed is printing money. I know guys say they're not printing money, they're doing something else, but money is fungible. It goes into the system, it moves around, you can't hide it. The money's been printed. We've had inflation. It's just not CPI inflation, it's asset inflation. You know, with gold, with stocks, with bonds, with art, with, with, with jewelry. We've had huge inflation. Now, of course, this is a, you know, a massive problem we've had in society is, is that the inflation went to the 1% who have own assets as opposed to the others. The idea was to create inflation, which would eventually you know, extinguish debt 
right? I mean, I mean, the way you get out of a debt problem is you default or inflate. And inflation is just a slow motion default. So the notion 10 years ago that Bernanke had of creating inflation to reduce debt was right. It didn't work because the inflation went to the wrong place. We need to create inflation for, for wages, for the middle class. And so Dr. Hunt is right in the idea that, that creating money will not create the inflation per se, because that money is not being spent. It's not going into the economy. It's just sitting in bank accounts. Uh, when it's 1% get money, they save so much more of it than the, the rest of society does. So the question is, how do you get that money to go into, um, into spending? And so that's where you're going to need to have um, just either fiscal spending uh, to get the money into the hands of ordinary people. And I think that's going to happen hand in glove with this demographic change of the millennials becoming spenders. And so that's, that's where it's kind of going to come. I think MMT, it's preposterous. I mean, that's all I can say. It's, it's a preposterous idea. The thing is, it doesn't happen right away. It could take quite a while for this to change. And being a, a reserve currency, where we have almost two-thirds of all global trade going through the U.S. dollar, there is no plan B. So in that sense, uh, this you know, we have a wily e. coyote moment for quite a while. But it's going to come. And so going back to your investing question, you don't short bonds today, but I think you have time to prepare yourself for when it's going to come. And inflation initially will be good, and then it won't be. And so uh, that's, that's kind of where I am on this thing. Uh, it, it's coming. Um, what's the best way to hedge it? Less clear, but I think real assets of some kind uh, is what you want to own in a portfolio. I think owning gold, 5 to 10% is not irrational. And remember, gold is not, uh, it's not an asset. It's not like a stock or a bond. And Warren Buffett dissed it, you know, a decade ago. It was a barbarous relic. He could buy, you know, so many Exxons and all the U.S. farmland with it. He's right about that, but it's not an asset. It's an alternate currency. And currencies, cash in the, I mean, cash in your hand, yield zero and gold yields zero. So uh, that's what it is. It's, it's a currency that can't be printed by other governments. So that's why you want to own it as a diversification. Let's talk a little bit more about inflation and the bond market, because there's an old adage that inflation is a bond market's worst enemy. But I want to go a little bit deeper into that. Is it really true that inflation causes bond markets to sell off? Or is it the expected monetary policy response that the central banks are going to fight inflation by raising policy rates, which really causes bond markets to sell off? And the reason I ask that is it seems to me that when we get inflation that might cause you or me to think, boy, uh, this could turn into a problem, policymakers ought to be fighting this. Uh, I think they're going to continue encouraging it for a while after you and I think that's the bad move. So when do we worry about the bond market really selling off? Is it when the inflation starts or not until the central bank policy reaction is to try to fight it with uh, raising policy rates? Now, away from speculators, uh, I would say you're wrong on both counts. Okay. Uh, all apologies, please. I, I, I think the driving – what is money all about? Money is about delayed spending. You work, you make X dollars, and if you don't spend it all today, you delay it and you spend it at a different point of your life. So you have your savings for that. That's why you have cash. But we're not in a barter economy anymore. I think what's going to drive bond prices is people looking at this delayed spending power and saying, how many loaves of bread can I buy with it? Oh, my God, what if I could buy fewer loaves of bread you know, in X number of years? That's a bad idea. You either spend now, and that gets the velocity back up again, or you get out of things that are fixed coupon, like a bond, and go somewhere else. So I think the dynamic of the investing class as a whole, uh, all people, moving money around to other things that will protect their savings, protect their spending power, protect their purchasing power, protect the number of loaves of bread they could buy in the future. I think that's what kind of drives it. And you'll probably see spending pulled forward. And remember, GDP also equals money times velocity. The money has exploded with all the Western central banks. The velocity has collapsed in tandem. So we've had very little change in GDP. Once we get that velocity of money picking up, linking back, that'll happen when the millennials come to the workforce, start spending, that's when you get the inflation. So I see that, that, that that's how it's going to occur. 
and the Fed is, is, is pushing on a string in the sense that they're pushing money into the economy, into the, into the Fed system, but it's not making people spend money. I think the spending is going to occur with the demographic as well as with the fear of inflation eroding their savings. So, I mean, that, that's kind of what you had like in Weimar, Germany, which we're not going to do, but people were trying to spend the money as fast as they could get it. And you said in, in, in the Venezuela or Nigeria, the same kind of idea where people spend money as fast as they could get it because the value depreciates so quickly. So that's kind of where it's going to happen. It kind of all comes together at a point. We're not there yet, but there's an inflection point coming. And that's what you want to kind of be, be thinking about and, 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 and watching for. And I think Fed has been saying over and over again now, time for fiscal policy. What's interesting is, you know, both parties lined up to go and spend money directly to the, uh, the population via various methods. My preferred method would be infrastructure products. So at least you get something out of the cash being spent. But, you know, direct funds to people, uh, UBI or other uh, tax rebates. Either of those is basically uh, you know, the government borrowing money, printed from the Fed, and giving it to people who propensity to save is very small. So I think that's what's, that's what's going to be coming from. I think that's where you're going to see rates start to rise, not because people are selling them per se, but they're not buying them while the government is, is continuing to borrow. So it's really a question of how long can the Fed keep buying securities? <sighs> Looking at Japan, and the answer is an awful long time. Of course, the difference is Japan has a very different demographic than we do. Theirs is declining on all aspects, whereas ours is not. So we are different than Japan in, the, in that respect. Harley, what do we do in terms of portfolio allocation as this transition you're describing comes? You mentioned real assets and you mentioned gold. What other real assets? Are we looking at real estate? You know, things like real estate investment trusts were very popular decades ago. They've kind of been out of vogue for a few decades. Is that going to be the next big thing? Or where should people be thinking about starting to reposition their, their portfolios? Mortgage REITs, where the entity is buying Mortgages on assets, I kind of like that, especially when the credit is solid. Other kinds of property REITs, I have no interest in. I have no idea what commercial real estate is going to be doing for the next decade. That's a, that's a, that's a black hole I'm going to avoid. Truth be told, I kind of like is uh, – I'm careful of saying this. I actually think I'm bullish on stocks right now. Stocks are actually a, a claim on a real asset, a company making, making a profit, making a business, making money. And if you look at the current structure of the market, you know, the Fed has said we're keeping rates at zero or 0.1 for the next 30 months, or at least as the dot plots say. They're probably going to keep the cash tenure at below 1%. They kind of have to. Is that yield curve control? Will they come out and say it explicitly, or will they just go and buy the bonds to make it happen? Unclear, but it probably does that also. If you look at the S&P, I mean, the trailing dividend yield of the S&P is about 2%. If you use the dividend futures market, which is a better idea, so let's go to slide nine. This is on Bloomberg, and they trade futures on dividends. They trade it on S&P, on the European SX5, on the Japanese Nikkei. It's not the most liquid instrument in the world, but they exist. You can see over here that the futures on the S&P indicate a annual dividend of about 50 bucks going up to 2025. And if you look at slide 10, uh, that's the um, near contract. And you can see that it was trading in the 60s, and then it dropped down to 40, and now it's about you know, 52. And these contracts were trading in the 60s, you know, at the beginning of the year. If you look at that $51, $52 dividend divided by, you know, a percent and a half, you get the Dow, I mean, so the S&P up to like 3,000. Is owning a claim on the top companies in the country, I'm not talking small middle-sized businesses that are definitely going to get hurt right now, I'm talking the largest companies in the country, owning a claim on their business, and you could earn a yield of one and a half percent, one maybe 165 right now, with 51 bucks uh, of dividends. You could earn that, and you have upside. You know, stocks can go up. 30-year treasuries go into par, right? 10-year treasury now yields, uh, what, 0 0.6, 0 0.65? It's going to par. So you could actually own claim on a real asset, get a higher yield, cash flow yield, than owning treasuries, and you have upside. As a matter of fact, it's better than that 
it's actually a, it's, it, it's a convex upside. Because stocks only go down to zero, but they can go up one, two, three, four times. I mean, look at from the uh, 09 crash. We had the spoos at, what, 650, 660? Now it's 3,000. So you have, you could make a lot more than you could lose. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but there's the potential for it. So you can get the same yield as a treasury and you have more upside. It seems to me that over the course of time, insurance companies and other kinds of long-term liability managers are going to have to go to equity. They give up nothing in the cash flow coupon and they have more upside. And, you know, most insurance companies, their cost of business is a lot more than one and a half percent. So I kind of see this underlying support over time bleeding into the equity market, which seems incredible to me, but I, I'm, I'm actually, I've got to be long and short, that's for sure. And there's some very interesting trades you could do to take advantage of that, uh, if you want to talk about that now. Let's do exactly that, Harley. And for our listeners' benefit, if you look here, we've been talking about the, the graph on page 9 and 10, but 11 and 12 and 13 provide some more charts showing the other dividend markets, uh, not just the S&P, but also the SX5E and so forth. Uh, let's move on to page 14. You've got a specific trade idea here. Talk us through it. I'm a macro investor. My concepts are two, three, five years in the future. I, I don't day trade. I rarely pick specific names. I like macro thoughts and what's going to happen in the big picture. And I size it appropriately to go and manage that risk. What's the wrong price right now? What's the wrong price right now is interest rates at zero. That's clearly the wrong price. And, 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 and if the Fed was not buying everything and holding rates down there, they'd be higher. If that's the wrong price, then what happens is if you look in the forward space out two, three, five years in the future, since all derivative instruments price off of forward pricing, where an asset will be cash flow adjusted in the future, what's happening right now is the S&P, the Nikkei, SX5D, their forward, their future price is actually below the current price, which means if you do an option trade based upon those instruments, the market will look at the forward and not the spot price. And so if you look at slide 13, you can see how the forward SPX price is actually below its current price. And then going back to slide 11, you can see how this relationship has uh, changed over time with Fed action and ECB action. So looking at a listed trade, and this was when the S&P was at 3,000, so the SPY ETF was at 300. The forward price, now I'm on page 14, forward price was 285 roughly. I could buy a call struck at 340, which is the old high. Sell a put struck at 230. Actually taking a small credit, let's call, it, let's call it flat once you put in the bid offers. So I own the upside above the all-time high, and I own the stock market at 230, two and a half years forward, right? This trade is uh, for expires in December of 2022. I, I kind of have it hard to believe that we're going to get below 230. I, I guess it's possible. We, got, we did that before a little bit, but if you think about that, uh, if you put a PE of 1675, so the inverse of that means that the earnings coming out of the S&P would yield 6%, right? One divided by 16.75. If I compare that to the 10-year or the 30-year, that's like 500 basis points over a treasury. So I'm getting a pretty good yield from the earnings. And then my dividend is above what they're kicking out. So it seems to me that that low is probably pretty good unless you're a super bear you think we're going into a massive recession, depression, and earnings are going to absolutely collapse. Because earnings last year was 163, and uh, the dividends paid last year was 58. And if you go put any kind of number on these things, I mean, you could, <laughs> I, I could see 4,000 on the spoos in, in two years, which is utterly crazy. I can't believe I'm saying this, but if the Fed was going to hold rates at zero on the front end and 1% in the, in the belly, I, I just don't see how money does not migrate there. Uh, if you really think about it, this is a very sexy idea because an equity, a stock, is actually a call option on the company where the strike price is the value of the bonds. 
Because if you liquidate a company, you pay the bondholders first, what's left goes to the stockholder. So you have that kind of leveraged upside on equity versus a bond, which all you get back is your principal. So if an, if an equity of a stock is a call option on a company, a real asset, a real company, and you're buying a call option via this structure, you're buying a call on a call. That's a very levered way to express a thought, a lot of convexity, a lot of positive leverage in your pocket. So this is an idea that I like a lot as a way to go take advantage of the Fed forcing the forward price down because of that 0% interest rate. So it's, um, it's risky. Uh, let's be clear. I mean, if, if we go below 230, you, you're, you're all downside. But as a profile, I kind of like having this trade and then supporting that with mid-grade, mid-expiry mid uh, fixed income products, five-year high-grade, maybe some, uh, some you know, munis, some mortgage REITs. So you kind of balance them out that way. That's, that, that's kind of my preferred portfolio. And then you toss in some gold. And uh, I mean, if you have you know, yields on some of these, you know, high-grade corporate bonds at, you know, three, three and change, some of the mortgage REITs are at eight, nine, ten. Munis, you know, they yield two and change, but if you're in a good tax bracket, then you're talking at four, four and a half. That's not that bad for a portfolio structure. I'm actually surprised, Harley, to hear you say 4,000 by the end of 22 is a crazy high number. I wouldn't have said that at all. Now, I certainly don't think that economic fundamentals are going to get us to those levels, but I have confidence in central bankers to get us to those levels uh, as long as nothing blows up first. So I, I think it, you know, the upside is very clear. But let's talk about the risk side of it. What if things do blow up and you do have to start thinking about below 2,300 on the S&P? How do you run the risk management on this trade? At what point do you start to bail out and, and eat a loss before you, you ride this all the way down? I'm making the assumption that if you're a, if you're a hedge fund manager running a levered portfolio, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying this is the best trade in the world because this is a beta trade. It's not, a, it's not an alpha trade. I, it's, it's, it's an alpha trade in the sense it's a better way to gain exposure to equities than just straight buying them outright. Uh, I mean, that you could, you could do some easy analysis on that showing why I'd rather have this than owning the straight up futures or the ETF SPY. But if you're not willing to own equity risk outright as a proportion of your portfolio, this is the wrong ticket for you. But I suspect everyone's going to have some kind of spooz uh, exposure in some manner, fashion, or form. And so you basically substitute owning this ETF or some other portfolio and you put this instead in there. And if you own equities outright, you are already, you know, have some kind of stop loss or thought in mind that you're running. But usually you have no stop loss. You're, you have a, a, a certain amount of portfolio allocated to this sector of the market. That's what it is. So that, that's kind of my thought on this. You, you, you buy enough of this so it's impactful if you're right, and you can survive the drawdowns if you're wrong. But the Fed's already kind of said whatever it takes. Are they going to buy equities? I sure hope not. But we've already seen you know, Europe and Japan uh, go down this path. So if push came to shove, I mean, the Fed will do whatever it takes to go and do this. So I, I kind of think, uh, I'm not saying the Fed put per se, but it sure looks like there's something there. And um, once again, you're not buying the whole economy. You're buying the top 500 companies. And frankly, you know, you're buying the top 100 companies. And I think they're going to do okay because they have – a population that is going to buy their products. And I think you got to think about that. And that's something else. I mean, right now, the top five companies, six companies, are 20% of the S&P 500. So, I mean, you're kind of buying the best companies out there right now, or at least the most um, most valuable. So I view this trade not as, a, as pure speculation, but as a better way to gain exposure to an asset class you would already own. And then going back away from mom and pop investors, I just, I just don't see how insurance companies or pensions, I don't see how they, they, they have this cash flow coming in, how it keeps going into only bonds. The cost of, I mean, most pension funds, state pensions run six and a half to seven and a half as their bogey. You know, buying treasuries at one, one and a half percent, one percent, they're kind of locking in a loss at that stage of the game. So I kind of think you have to see a migration into those assets over time. And if you put a, 
I mean, the dividend futures were trading at 65 last year. The actual dividends were 58 last year. Let's call it 60 is going to be where it's going to be three years from now. You put in a 60 div, you put in a 1.5% yield on that 60, that's 4,000 on the S&P. Will dividends be cut dramatically from here? Well, perhaps. But I think for the best companies, they're not going to be. What you might well see is money that was going to buybacks or other forms of, uh, of spending might go to support their dividends. So there's plenty of room to go and, uh, and support them for the best companies out there. Harley, I can't thank you enough for a terrific interview. Now, you're one of the few guys that we have on the show who's not selling anything. So we, we have no product for you to promote. But please do tell our listeners, you, you have a completely free website, convexitymaven.com. It's also possible to subscribe to a newsletter there that you put out from time to time. What is that about? What can people expect and where can they sign up? The website is convexitymaven.com. If you want to get added to it, you can send me a, an email to harley at bassman.net. Happy to respond to your comments. Uh, I always learn a lot from people who uh, know more than I do. And I, I write episodically. I think the key thing to note is that um, you know I'm a macro thinker. I, I am a long-term investor. Uh, I'm not a day trader. And that sizing is more important than entry level. You're not going to go to all, call the top or the bottom. You've got to allocate your portfolio accordingly that you could ride out the risk because surprises always happen. That's why they're called surprises. Size matters. And you heard it first from Harley Bassman. Patrick Ceresna and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right here at macrovoices.com. Macro Voices is a listener-driven program. Please email requests for specific future interview guests to requests at macrovoices.com. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com, and we'll answer them on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. We also welcome your suggestions for how we can improve the program. Now, back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Eric, it was great to have uh, Harley back on the show. You know, while he, you, we call him the convexity maven for his knowledge on bonds, he's also so smart when it comes to options and options trading. I just absolutely loved his ideas on the, on the S&P 500. Patrick, I know exactly what you mean, because as soon as we finished taping that interview, he hit me and said, uh, hey, I got a couple of suggestions for you to pass on to Patrick. And he's going off around the theta decay of the gamma X-ray negative whatever. And I'm like, um, I think you should talk to Patrick directly about that. One. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we should get him back onto the post game in a future episode so that you guys can go uh, heavy on the option Greeks and, and uh, I'll try to keep up. But in any event, let's go ahead for today's show and take our listeners to this week's post-game chart book. It's called Breakouts or Fakeouts. You'll find the download link in your Research Roundup email. If you don't have a Research Roundup email, just go to our homepage at macrovoices.com. Click on the red button that says Looking for the Downloads. Patrick, Breakouts or Fakeouts, starting on page two here with the euro against the U.S. dollar. What's going on? Eric, what I wanted to focus on was just bring a, a whole bunch of charts to our listeners' attention, just some really interesting things that are happening in the markets and setting up. And I think they're really important to watch as to whether they emerge as new major trends or whether or not this is just noise. And so I figured we'd play a game of uh, breakout or fake out and see uh, what we think on all of these. So on chart two is arguably the most important one because uh, we always talk about the U.S. dollar index, but the U.S. dollar index more than 50 50 percent of it is weighted against the euro and so really as goes the euro goes the dollar index and and one of the big uh, questions everyone asks today is are we entering a period where the u.s dollar is going to enter some sort of a bear market and begin a sustained decline that will impact inflation and commodities and all sorts of other areas and what i thought was really interesting is when you go and zoom out and look at like the last five plus years of the euro and we overlay on a weekly chart the volume by price showing where what price levels very large amounts of the volume has transacted one can see we're slowly approaching the top of this band this is a big trade range between like 108 to 114 and while we've certainly had two very meaningful spikes higher in the euro this year 
the real big question to solve is that, is this setting up for a big breakout? Are, are we about to see that US dollar breakdown and the euro breakout here? And watching whether this plays out, you know, that breakout about that 114, 115 is probably one of the single biggest intermarket uh, macro events if it does play out. And uh, that's definitely what I'm watching. My intuition is it doesn't happen, but uh, if it does, we can't ignore it, right? What's your take on uh, the euro? I agree with you, Patrick. My intuition is it doesn't happen. I think we might have already seen the top there. Maybe we'll test the top of that range one more time. But I don't think we see a full breakout. Something like a daily close over one spot 16 would really say to me, oopsie, we got that one wrong. If that's the case, I'd really be watching for the bottom to fall out on the dollar index because the euro makes up you know, the biggest portion of it. But my gut feeling is that you're right, that it's probably done here and that we're going to see the dollar strengthen. The, the reason that it would change that view would be if the Fed gets into another round of stimulus in response to more bad coronavirus news. If the Fed responds with even more stimulus reaction, that could be what pushes us up out of this trading range. And maybe it starts to run away from there. All right. Well, let, let's move on to page three, where I just wanted to look at the commodity complex broadly. And this is the uh, Bloomberg Commodity Index Futures. While we'll look at some individual commodities in a moment, what I thought was particularly interesting is, is that commodities have not really started to rise in any meaningful way on a broad basis. And this, to me, is one of the areas to watch whether or not the inflation boogeyman is really going to come out and we see sustained rising inflation expectations. You would think that broader rises in commodities would be accompanying that. And rather than uh, seeing you know sustained uh, higher highs, higher lows in a clean uptrend, this has not been able to really get off the mat. And in fact, it almost feels like it's rolling over. And so is this going to be a fresh new breakdown in the commodity index? Or is this just more of a bottoming formation where this is going to maybe retest some of these bottom ranges and turn up? And I really do actually think a lot of this will be linked with what happens with that uh, euro US dollar chart as well. And uh, watching whether this breaks down in any meaningful way is, is really uh, important. Uh, do you have a perspective as to whether you think this is going to break down? Well, I would say the same thing that you just said. Uh, I agree with you on the U.S. dollar to euro correlation, but I also think that inflation expectations are really where it's at. You, know, you listen to a lot of our smartest guests. They're all saying, look, it's definitely coming. But you know what? It's still a couple of years off. And what this chart kind of says to me on page three is, okay, we're having the little inflation scare here, and maybe we're going to go down to a new bottom or you know a slightly lower low or just stay in a consolidation pattern. Maybe what we're seeing is that low from back at the end of March versus the high that we hit in early June. Maybe that forms the, the upper and lower bounds of a consolidation range, and we just consolidate for the next year or two before inflation expectations really start to take off and drive commodities higher. Now, if you look at this chart on page three, that one tiny little red candle below the blue line there doesn't really, you know, it's, it's only one itsy bitsy little candle. It's just barely below the line. It doesn't say much. But if you move on to page four, you know, it's, it's just one particular commodity instead of the whole index. But boy, if that's a leading indicator in what corn's doing, you know, you've got the same basic picture, but that breakdown is much more pronounced. So maybe that's an indication of things to come for commodities more broadly. Yeah, let's say we're when we pull up oil charts, of course, oil and gasoline and everything have been moving relatively higher. But when you really look at the grains as an aggregate, like whether you're looking at wheat, which has been pretty weak, soybean hasn't been able to really get anything going, nor have uh, w there was actually some crazy price action in rice futures. And really corn here, very distinct break on the downside is just in this segment of commodities. This is, there's nothing happening right now. They all look like they're rolling over very weak, and it doesn't seem like there's uh, an imminent bid coming in here. And so uh, to me, these look like they're breaking down. And, you know, uh, it's, it's to me, they look like uh, the early stages of the breakdown a, a month ago on natural gas. And it's just sometimes these commodities break on the downside and they can't seem uh, to get any uh, bids and they just bleed out. Anyway, I, this corn chart looks pretty weak. 
Nonetheless, I wanted to move on to the one commodity where there is some really interesting strength, and that's on page five, and that's on the lumber futures. And, you know, it's interesting because when you look at a lot of the, the housing stocks and, and even some of the other home builder components, things like uh, Home Depot or Lowe's, they, they all seem to actually be behaving like there's a, some sort of a new bull market. That's a, it's certainly where there is relative strength. And over the last week, these lumber futures really started to move to the upside. It's going to be one of the really interesting things to see whether or not this bumps its head along these highs from February or whether this is a legitimate turn because the lumber prices actually had much higher prices when you look back a year or two. And so the question here, is this just going to be a, a tap into this previous high or is this a real breakout? That's one of the big questions to solve. Patrick, let's move on to gold on page number six, because as you're showing here, you know, there is one downsloping trend line that we've broken through. But if you thought about this as a horizontal consolidation pattern, we really haven't seen a breakout yet. How do you read this one? I mean, it looks like the way you've drawn it here, you're kind of showing the breakout version as opposed to the fake out version. Does that mean you're expecting that or is it just one way of drawing the line? Well, at this moment, whenever you have a breakout, often the the better thing to do is to give the bulls the benefit of the doubt that they'll make it stick. I mean, I think uh, at this stage, they're clearly attempting to to take gold to the next level. And obviously, we were talking about that uh, 1922 previous high, but there is that measured move that measures all the way to 2000. And so if, if this breakout sticks, there is plenty of upside on gold, especially after spending two months consolidating. So that kind of unwinds the overbought state from that advance back in March and April. And so it really can slingshot higher. And so well, watching this over the next week to see whether this uh, breakout is actually for real is, uh, is going to be huge. It's, uh, it's one of those uh, ones that uh, has been, we've been waiting to see if it breaks out and it's attempting to do it. So that's on my radar. Patrick, I couldn't agree more. If we see the price of gold move above 1785 uh, off the top of my head and stay there for several days, it really suggests that the next move higher is upon us. And as you say, that next move could be substantially higher. And, you know, as much as I, I want to say, well, keep in mind, folks, you know, we are overdue here for a, a steep technical correction. I've been saying that for months. This consolidation sideways here has been going on since the beginning of April. So, you know, we're we're already into almost three months of consolidation. Uh, a breakout, a decisive breakout above the consolidation kind of invalidates that expectation of a lower number. And I'm tempted to say, well, a stock market crash because of the coronavirus could pull it down. Well, the thing is, look at the stock market. It's not crashing. If anything, it seems to be expecting more stimulus as a result of the coronavirus to carry the market higher. So I, I think the odds are on a move higher from here. So Eric, on page seven, uh, I want to move on to the the palladium futures. And what was interesting here is because we showed the chart on gold. And one of the things I would always like to see is to see a number of the precious metals all confirming this. And in the, the particular order, silver made it all the way back up towards its previous high and is kind of flagging for a potential breakout. And uh, platinum has tried to get off of the worst levels, but is not is a little bit weaker than silver. And then there's a palladium here and palladium seems to actually be actively distributed almost every rally seems to be sold and it continues to to just show signs of potentially breaking down and i, I don't know maybe we have uh, some listeners that are, are more in line with understanding what's going on in these precious metals markets but i find it uh, at least i would have really liked to have seen all of them kind of behaving in a, a much more bullish manner to confirm gold and maybe that's a, a warning you know we'll have to watch but uh, it certainly looks here that like uh, palladium is breaking down what's your take I think that silver is the important confirmation signal for gold, and we are seeing signs of, of silver echoing the, the bullish patterns that we're seeing in gold. So I think you got your confirmation there. Platinum and palladium futures, honestly, there, there's a lot of uh, fundamentals that have to do with automotive applications and so forth that uh, I don't fully understand it. It's not my area of expertise, so I don't really know what's going on here. I'm sure we probably have listeners who could tell us exactly what the cause is of this, but as far as looking for a confirmation signal to validate the gold chart, I think silver is giving you a pretty strong message. All right. Well, let's move on to uh, page eight, where I just wanted to revisit these high yield bonds or junk bonds. 
And uh, we've obviously had a very strong recovery off of those March lows when the Fed gave indication that they would consider buying some of these ETFs to provide the liquidity to keep a stable bond market. But uh, after uh, seeing um, this initial strength in April, really, junk bonds have not been able to make much higher highs, and they're not really gaining any momentum. In fact, they're losing momentum, almost like if they're slightly rolling over. I wouldn't call this a breakdown yet, but certainly they've uh, stopped participating on the upside and have been lagging. So the question here, do we finally see this rollover in junk bonds? Do they break to a lower low? Do we see that this area of the market starts to show weakness? This is uh, definitely something that's on my radar to watch. Well, Patrick, I think that certainly if you were long junk bonds, getting out of them would would make a lot of sense. Um, As far as shorting them, though, I still wouldn't dare. And the reason is we've seen the Fed clearly signal that they intend to support the junk bond market. So I think if you saw a crash in junk bonds, and and I do see plenty of economic fundamentals to support exactly that, uh, I don't think the Fed would let it get very far before they intervened again. All right. And finally, uh, on page nine, just the S&P 500, right? And this is obviously that I'm a little bit bearish and uh, deep inside there's a bear tucked away. And I was ju- looking to see whether this S&P rolls over in some, uh, some meaningful way. But often when you had such a big advance in the markets, there's going to be a period of correction where it backfills the rally, consolidates and then uses that base to begin a new advance. And I think one of the more interesting puzzle pieces to solve here is that is this just the market taking a breather and backfilling some of that previous rise before it has a continuation? Or was this it? Has the bear market rally really kind of played out and is the market now rolling over? It's one of the more interesting things to observe which one of these play out. Patrick, I see this one purely as a tug of war between economic fundamentals, which definitely call for lower equity prices because it is a bear market rally. And there's lots of economic reasons to expect much lower equity prices, according to old normal rules. The other side of the tug of war is we've got the new normal where central bank accommodation plays a bigger role than economic fundamentals in stock prices. And that would support the the case for higher stock prices, maybe even new all-time highs. So far, as much as it frazzles me, it seems like the central bank accommodation side is winning the tug of war over economic fundamentals. Now, do do you make the the argument that, well, the economic fundamentals fundamentals have to win in the end? Or is it just the ability of the Fed to conjure unlimited amounts of money out of thin air that wins in the end, as seems to be the case? Um, I don't want to bet either way, frankly, from what I see here. But where you can find a sure bet, folks, is a free trial of Patrick's service, Big Picture Trading. Take a look at page 10, where you'll find all the information you need to get a free 14-day trial to Patrick's service. We're going to leave it there for this week's episode. Please do help us out by rating and reviewing us on iTunes. Again, the instructions step-by-step for how to do that are in your research roundup email. This episode was made possible by toptradersunplugged.com. Remember to get the ultimate guide to the best investing books ever written at toptradersunplugged.com forward slash macro guide. For information on sponsoring Macro Voices, please visit macrovoices.com forward slash sponsor info. Listeners, be sure to register a free account at macrovoices.com. The benefit to you is you'll receive our research roundup email, which provides you with all of the best free content that we could find on the internet each week, including downloads associated with our guest appearances, as well as, of course, our post-game chart books. Patrick, tell them what they missed in this week's research roundup. This week, you're going to find the transcript for today's interview, as well as a link to both the chart book Harley Bassman shared and the charts we discussed here in the post game, as well as a link to the Chris Martinson video going into detail on the D614G mutation of the coronavirus. You're also going to find a link to the video interview with Nouriel Rubini on Bloomberg, as well as an interesting article by Jesse Felder on the biggest disconnect between prices and profit in stock market history. So you'll find this and so much 
much more in this week's research roundup. That does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners. And we're always looking for suggestions on how we can make the program even better. Now, for those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share that content with our listeners, send us an email at researchroundup at macrovoices.com or tag it with the MVRR hashtag on Twitter, and we will consider it for our weekly distributions. If you have not already, follow us on our main Twitter account, at Macro Voices for all the most recent updates and releases. You can also follow Eric on Twitter, at Eric S. Townsend, and myself, at Patrick Serezna. On behalf of Eric Townsend and myself, thank you for listening, and we'll see you all next week. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the Internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com. <laughs>